introduce our speaker today. Just a few adjustments. Okay. Um, we're very happy to have Dr. Barry Hart here with us today. I'm just gonna mention a, a few highlights from his um, very full career. Um, Barry Hart is Emeritus Professor of Trauma, Identity and Conflict Studies at the Center for Justice and Peace Building um, at Eastern Mennonite University. Um, he has conducted many workshops on peace building, psychosocial trauma recovery and reconciliation throughout the world. He was a found, founder member of EMU's Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, the STAR program. And today he will be talking about the trust building programs of initiatives of change. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Hello to everyone online and in person. That too, again. Um, I was just trying. There was a, a introduction today. Mm -hmm. You also read something about me. I just want to say that um, I recently got back from South Sudan and uh, worked for UNDP over a year period, uh, training 45 psychosocial support facilitators in peace building and trust building. And out of that came this community uh, training manual on trauma awareness and psychosocial support with a significant uh, trust building section in it. It's online now, it's free, it's free access. So I, I will give the, uh, the link and you can send it out to people that might want it. I mentioned that because it's been part of my work doing international work, winding up in, um, Switzerland, I was the director of the Coe Scholars Program in Coe, Switzerland for uh, 14 years. And it was in that context that I met Alex Wise, uh, Pat's nephew. Is it? And uh, we together with a few other people there developed the trust building program for initiatives of change. It's a uh, Fetzer sponsored it initially and recently contributed even some more funding to the program. We're always looking for more funding. I don't know, uh, I should say something about initiatives of change. I don't know if you went online to look at that, but it used to be called Moral Rearmament. And before that, it was called the Oxford Group, started by Frank Bookman uh, in the uh, 20s. Uh, he was a Lutheran pastor who decided to help people look inside themselves. Christians initially, but also working kind of across the spectrum of people, religious and non-religious, uh, beginning with ourselves to build trust, to build peace. We have to do the interior look. That's not so far removed from who we are as Christians. That interior looking is essential for uh, becoming uh, people of, who are trustworthy uh, and people who attempt to walk alongside others. I, I'd like to share this morning about trust and breaking the barriers of trust and then show you a short video about the uh, trust building program of initiatives for change. Not initiative for change, but initiatives of change. Distinction uh, is made there because we're not trying to create change for others, but to walk alongside and help people in the change process. The uh, idea of the issues of change trust building program uh, is something that's needing to be understood as an exercise of walking with people and not uh, saying this is how you build trust in your context, and in your culture. Because this particular program is in 11 countries at this point in time. And I'll talk uh, about those countries in a bit. So after a, a small conversation with you, uh, we'll look at the video and then have a, any type of Q&A or response that you might have to what I've had to say. Uh, let me define trust, but first of all, why don't you take just a minute to think about what trust is, how you understand trust. We use the word, it's there, it's a significant word in our vocabulary, hopefully, 
Uh, but what is trust for you? And then think about what does it mean to build trust or to break down the barriers uh, when trust has been violated. So just take uh, 30 seconds to think about that and we'll come back to that in our conversation. So all definitions are welcome. Nothing's wrong. It's your definition of trust, your understanding. But it has been defined, trust has been defined as having confidence in another person or group and that they are reliable. A person who is reliable or said another way, trust is a general expectation that other people can be relied upon relied on. Mm -hmm. And that's a good feeling when we have someone we can trust or our group can trust uh, another group. In today's world, there's a lot of division and so many barriers have been put up um, that prevent this trust between individuals and groups of people. And we have to ask why that's the case. I we usually know when we are willing or not to trust someone. We intuit that that person is reliable and is being honest, is acting with integrity, uh, and is fair-minded. We don't always know this until later in the relationship, or maybe too late, uh, when we have been hurt or wounded. When trust is violated, when reliability, integrity, mutual respect with dignity and honest actions are missing, we become angry, confused, and we feel like we've been deceived and are gullible. Not a good feeling at all. So building trust out of the ashes of deceit, uh, deceit historical trauma, identity manipulation, a whole range of other things is really what the Initiatives of Change Trust Building Program is all about. Because of all of these things that happen, oftentimes in a cyclical manner where a group is violating my group, uh, and now I don't, I don't trust that group. But then I may have violated that group decades ago, or my group has done that centuries ago. I worked in the, in the Balkans in former Yugoslavia for five years. And you can go back 600 years at least in that set to know that there is this cycle of violence. Where one group hurts one group, and then that history is passed down through stories and music and poetry and so forth. And it's never dealt with. That cycle of violence is never dealt with. And so 600 years later, you can justify a response against that group because they wounded us and we still feel it. We don't want that to happen again. So building trust between these groups is not easy. We have to deal with the feelings of deceit and uh, anger, being dishonored and exploited. And uh, if we do that and do the interior work, it may be those people that violated our trust, but we also have to do some material work. We don't want to discount the fact that there are injustices here, and injustice also needs to be met. But sometimes in building trust, we who have been violated sometimes have to reach out. Now, people will argue against that. Why should the victim have to reach out to the perpetrator? Well, if we want that trust, be reestablished and those barriers to come down, that rebonding to occur, then, then uh, we need to do the interior work as well and potentially reach out. And I, I won't say this is always the case, but uh, that's the challenge. When we decide to do that, then we can start to build a bridge of trust between people. 
this is something, uh, again, it's not an easy uh, approach to take because being dishonored and having our dignity violated. Dignity, as a colleague of mine, Donna Hicks says, is that feeling of inherent value and worth. I feel worthy, that inherent feeling of value and value as an individual. And I sense that you value me in that way. But when that bond is broken, when that dignity has been violated, that trust is honored, then those things are truly problematic in terms of reestablishing trust. Um, there are several questions we have to ask ourselves uh, before rebuilding trust can take place. Am I ready to begin the process? I am, am I emotionally ready to do so? Am I willing to do the deep introspection necessary for such a process to begin and to work towards trust and the possibility of reconciliation? Possibility of reconciliation. That's a long process. Uh, often in Christian community, you know, we say, forgive the person deeply. Christ has forgiven us, and therefore we need to forgive. And that's certainly a great premise, an important one to pay attention to. But it's been my experience in working with mistrust and trauma and a whole range of other things that there's a long process that we need to go through beforehand to actually get ready to forgive and move towards reconciliation if that is the goal of everyone. So it's a, it's a, it's a work. We need to, to do that interior work. So are we willing to shine the searchlight on ourselves? Uh, test if our values of honesty, integrity, dignity, and love are in place or need to be worked on. So we need to work on these elements of ourselves. Uh, these will be needed uh, if we're willing to take the personal responsibility to break the cycle of blame and violence and find common ground in the exchange. And this is what we've been trying to do across these 11 programs uh, in, um, if I can name them all, uh, in Burundi, in India, in Nepal, in Australia, South Africa, uh, France, Canada, uh, where else? Kenya, and I probably missed uh, country or two along the way. But the idea is that going into these countries to do this work, asking people on both sides of the divides, whether it may be an ethnic divide, a religious divide, a community police divide, a young people and uh, authority divide, whatever it might be, um, whatever division is there, whatever chasm is, needs to be crossed and uh, trust built or reestablished, then it's uh, asking people to do a lot of um, hard work on all sides and creating that safe space and that place, some people call it a brave space for people to actually hear each other and to work at the first steps of um, reestablishing that trust. And this is true for peace building, trust building, uh, restoring relationships you know, based on uh, having been traumatized. Um, again, in, in South Sudan, as you may have read recently, the ongoing violence there is uh, just appalling after 50 to 70 years fighting war and you know these community uh, facilitators that we've trained in what we call psychosocial support is really helping people with their trauma but it's also they're trained in peace building and trust building to help kind of go to the root causes of some of these issues so these things don't happen again so that cycle of violence can be broken now we take small steps in that direction and things don't change overnight. And at the same time, 
Uh, we continue because our value base is such that we believe that this is the right way to go. And so people always ask me, you know, you're a peace builder. You ever see peace in this world? It's just chaos, it's violence. And I have to be reminded of one of my seminary professors said, the scripture says the poor will be with you always, but it doesn't have to be the same poor. That is, we can work over here, potentially build trust and relationships. And yes, you'll continue that conflict and distrust in different places, but you can work in your context to build relationships and trust in a way. And I mentioned this concept of bonding. We know from a Christian perspective that we're meant to be with each other, to love God with a whole and to love our neighbor. And I say it this way, as we love ourselves, because that connection is, is necessary. It doesn't work without all those things being true. And of course, as Christians, we say, well, we can't love ourselves, but we must love ourselves. That's part of it. And we must love our neighbor. We must love God in that greatest sense of must. Uh, we have that need. But we know through neuroscience today, that we're actually meant to be with each other. We're born to bond. As uh, one psychoanalysis study says that we've done brain uh, studies that indicate there's a link between us in the brain and we're meant to be with each other. And of course, there's this concept of the Ubuntu in South Africa, which means I have my humanity through you you have your humanity through me, and without each other, we're not complete. So we're meant to be with each other. What has broken those bonds? I always wondered why I was in peace building, and I finally figured it out. It was to reestablish the bonds that have been broken uh, around mistrust, around trauma, around violence, and to break those cycles of violence and mistrust to reestablish the bond that is meant to be who we are and what we're about. Mm -hmm. So that might be a good place to kind of go into the video. Uh, you will see uh, Talia Smith, who is our project coordinator, program coordinator for uh, the Trust Building Program. And she is accepting an award that was given uh, by the, the UN, and you'll see this. And she'll explain the program. We'll see a little bit of the videos of some of these trust funded um, projects. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Intercultural Innovation Award 2021, a partnership between the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations and the BMW Group. It's a pleasure to have you all here in person joining us or virtually from anywhere around the world to celebrate innovative grassroots projects that really work together on an intercultural dialogue, work towards a socially inclusive world by building mutual respect amongst people from different cultural and religious identities, rejecting violent extremism and embracing diversity. 
And embracing diversity is what the world needs and what our culture needs. What does... Welcome again. Now, let me ask you this. Creating inclusive communities is definitely a challenging undertaking. And from your experience, would you say there's a difference between cultures and countries in creating these communities? Talia, what is your point of view? I think so, Flo, yes. Like, to a large extent, each different region in a country and the communities, they have their own culture. And we have to think of our work and adapt to that specific culture. We work very, very locally, so our approach is contextualized to each local culture, take, each local community, taking into account their culture um, and their needs. Then on the other hand, we work through a human-centered approach. So we look at how we work with individuals is at the heart of our work. So that really transcends national boundaries. Inspiring. Now, Let's look at the last project of this category and how initiatives of change impact communities around the entire world. The Trust Building Program believes trust is the foundation for developing healthy communities. The project inspires and equips people with the values and skills needed to build mutual care across divides, heal historical wounds through honest conversations, and develop new networks to foster peace and social cohesion. The Trust Building Program addresses religious divides in Kenya the rise of extremist attitudes in France and Indonesia, hate speech and discrimination in Canada, community breakdown in South Africa, racism in Australia, and mistrust and inequality in Nepal. Four new countries will be taken on in 2022. The program's tools include inter-ethnic dialogues, workshops, outreach activities, and sport. It gives participants inspiration, skills, confidence, and connections needed to be trust builders in their local community. Through their actions, Trust Building Program wants to play a part in the wider conflict prevention agenda. Talia, you have a framework and a methodology that works and that offers a way forward to communities in conflict. Can you tell us a, a little brief framework and how it works? Sure, thanks for the question, Flo. So Initiatives of Change works to make the connection between personal and societal change. So we believe that change starts with oneself. So we inspire individuals to take positive changes in their own communities. And we work with sharing personal stories and other means for that. We also build diverse networks of stakeholders that are um, committed to building trust in their communities. Because you have to have everyone in the room. You have to have the women, the youth, the business leaders, government officials, media, migrants everyone to feel like they have a stake in the, in the problem and then also to work to be part of the solution with it. And then as part of the um, looking at inter intercultural dialogues, we work with uh, creating safe spaces where people can really share their voice openly um, and then looking at elements like historical wounds. So how do you look at the different narratives that are present in a conflict? And how do you take care of those and also share openly around these historical wounds? And it's really, you know, we, we work on a collective healing, personal trauma. So it's deep work and it's, it's really challenging. So this award is really a testimony to our, to our seven teams because they do the hard work on the ground. And, and we're in it for the long haul. We build authentic relationships over time. Um, and it takes, yeah, the time and commitment and the, the dedication to build trust across the world's divides. <laughs> Thank you. 
and there it is again. It takes time and commitment, and that's really what all, every single awardee demonstrates with their work. So we have come to the end of our conversation, but not yet to the end of the award. So please allow me to give another round of applause to all of your work and congratulate you. <laughs> National Trust Building, Switzerland, Talia Smith. All right. What questions do you have or comments uh, based on the video or anything I said about trust and trust building? We'll just take the and you online can chime in as well. Oh, okay. Oh. That's always good. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ah, so the Boy Scouts put trust, your group, yeah. at the top of the list. And why did you? Well, you know, without us, there are no real relations. Connection, 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 relationship, relationship, relationship. This is really what it's all about. And this is what the Initiative Change Trust Building Program attempts to do through workshops, through trainings, through ritual. In, in Australia, they've done a lot with ritual between uh, Aboriginal peoples and whites in um, Australia, using ritual to bind and bring people. Other thoughts or questions? Yes. The groups in France? Yes. They, there it's called We Act, Yes Act. It's young people who have oftentimes had difficulties with authorities, whether in school or with the police and building those relationships, finding ways to bring people together, to hear each other, to tell their own narratives. The police have their narrative and the young people have theirs. And oftentimes it's the, the marginalized communities that we act attempts to work with within the school system because often uh, people are radicalized in these communities because they need to be recognized. They need to have their own uh, dignity honored, but oftentimes dignity is honored in negative ways. So we act as attempting to bring people together to hear the narratives and stories of uh, people across those divides. Yes. Uh, we are supported by everybody. Uh, initiatives of change has really kind of broadened out in, in ways that uh, look for uh, relationships and support and so forth from across the spectrum. The churches have been uh, particularly helpful because there's a, a residence there and, and the roots of initiatives of change are in the church. And I, I want to just be clear too, there are people across the spectrum religiously and non-religiously engaged in this work. But at the heart, there's a lot of uh, Christian values, but those values I think can be found in many places. Yes, go ahead. If you go back to history, all the way back, all of these people found in the whole thing that had their rules. 
Yeah, and you have to ask why all these divisions? You know, what is going on in us and what is going on in them? And until we hear each other's narratives, stories in a safe environment um, and a, a, a structured, but also safe and caring environment, then you know, we're really not going to understand why those differences exist. And my experience is that once people get into those safe spaces, they really do come together. The problem is when they leave those spaces, they have to go back into their communities. And many, many times I've worked with people in trust building or peace building, and they've come together in a way that's just been remarkable. They've celebrated, they've, they've sung, they've danced together, they've experienced rituals together and so forth, they've prayed together. And we have to, to prepare them, they have to prepare themselves to go back into their communities because their communities didn't have that same experience. And it, it's real when we get together uh, because we have this mutual dependence on each other, this interdependence based on the fact that we're meant to be bonded and not separated out. But if you don't take those steps, then I mean, I think people have been taking those steps. I mean, we, 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 it feels like we're in chaos, and we are, but we would have spun completely you know, out of this world if there weren't people of goodwill who have done the introspection, who have attempted to converse with others who are different to find out their stories. I mean, I know that's true. And if you look at these 11 programs, there's no perfection here. But when you get the, the police and the community in Nigeria, for example, uh, the, the community has never understood the story of the police. And the police, you know, they're, they're told a story. They haven't heard the community story. And coming together, I mean, there's just these incredible, we, we call them, uh, what is it? moments of significant change. And there's so many stories that we're hearing and recording for the world, the rest of the world to see as well, that are impacting people. And people understand that they get it. They, they get a person uh, in Nigeria uh, paying for a policeman's lunch. And the policeman said, no one's ever done that for you before. You know, why did you do it? Well, I wanted to get to know you, you know. I, I've, I've disparaged you for such a long time. 
when I find out you have a story as well. Now, you know, we, we can really kind of get into our own space and just stay safe uh, and not move out in, in, into these other areas. Uh, in, in my church, uh, we're reading a book called White Supremacy and Me. And I'm getting slapped around all the time about, you know, everything from, um, um, well, everything related to white supremacy. I mean, there's just so many things that are out there that I have reflected on before, but also don't know about, don't think about. I'm constantly being talked about it through this book and our conversations about what's in the unconscious, what's baked in, in terms of our racism and that sort of thing. And, you know, we, I, I want to reject some of, of that challenge, but then I have to listen to it as well. And then we discuss it. And then we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with this discussion? How are we going to move out? You know, and we're not going to make a great move, but maybe individually and to some degree collectively, we can make small differences. And that's, that's how I work. I mean, I've been in peace building for 40 years. And I know it's the, the, the values of peace, the values of trust that keep me going. And do I make a difference? Yeah, I've seen differences in 40 years. Is it a great difference? I don't know. I don't know some of those differences. It's just been, I've been trying to be honest to do this work and you know where it goes, others have to decide as well. But I, I know it has made some. Um, as a person who works in the arts, I'm curious about how what you've seen uh, in terms of the longer term effects beyond the disability and the pain. Yeah. yeah. To be first a little bit. Uh, what, how do you see that that factoring in? Yeah. Well, I mentioned Australia. Uh, a long time ago, they started something called Sorry Days, where the whites, I, I don't like the word sorry, I'm sorry, but this is a very powerful word in uh, Australia, particularly within the Aboriginal community. So if someone says they're sorry for what has been done, then that has meaning. Well, they had this whole movement in Australia, which is continuing. And it, you have the, um, let's say ambassador, the president, the prime minister uh, has apologized to the Aboriginal people. Now that was just one apology. Well, what policies are going to evolve out of that? Well, slowly, as we say, step by step, policies are changing and there's a difference being made in that context, but it continues. And these rituals are so important, the singing, the dancing together, uh, but they're a part of a bigger movement to change the injustices that are found and baked in both unconsciously and consciously into the policies of the country. So that, that would be one area. Uh, and, you know, it's it, it's quite amazing actually what's happened there. It's, this sorry day started back in the 80s, and, and now, you know, 40 years later, it's still happening. It needs to continue, but it is happening because people of good faith and care for each other on both sides are saying, you know, this bridge needs to be built. We need to continue to construct it in ways that are not just feel good ways, but in ways that actually shift how we uh, interact through our everyday policies in life. So, yes. In this country, what are we doing? Uh, We've got a whole hundred years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you heard of Hope in the City? In, in, Rich, in Richmond, Virginia? Hope in the city. Well, about 30 years ago, uh, both African-Americans, Blacks, and whites 
in the city got together to, to talk about whole in terms of the relationships between blacks and whites in, in Richmond. And uh, a lot of good things have happened out of that. In fact, one of the things that occurred was the Community Trust Building Fellowship, which was the foundation for initiatives of change trust building program. And uh, if you've had an opportunity, as I have, I've taken students on this term of slave is a, a problematic because it's about people being enslaved by enslavers. But there's something that was developed called the Slave Trail. And uh, it's along the James River in Richmond. And it's where the uh, people who were enslaved were uh, offboarded onto the land and yoked together with chains where they had to walk like this, you know, in a line behind each other. And my students and I uh, many times have gone there and, and walked this slave trail. And then we have a talk by one of these people that helped develop Hope in the Cities, an African-American named T. Turner, a pastor, who talks about enslavement in Richmond. And you may be aware that at one point in time, uh, it's called, I think it's Indian Hill now, you can overlook Richmond. And we, we, we would go there and someone would say to us, during the height of enslavement, there were um, maybe 250,000 people in Richmond one day, and 100,000 people in Richmond the next day because the slave traders bought and sold people and those 150,000 people that were out, going out into the plantations in the South. So one of the greatest um, places of enslavement and the sales of people was Richmond, Virginia. And there's a lot going on there now in terms of their, uh, uh, there's a, a Civil War museum that actually balances out the stories of, of people who were impacted by the Civil War. Uh, there's a, they're, they're building up a lot of other things that, and there, Richmond has had African American uh, mayors for years. Something very unique as the statues have come down. Um, so, what are we doing? You know, these are small steps, but important steps that reflect movement, slow as it is, in terms of changing uh, the, the narrative and the paradigm of our relationships with each other. We're interdependent, we need each other. We need to. Yes, there's a lot more we need to do. You know, churches need to study uh, issues of racism and homophobia and a whole range of things. So we become informed. One of the biggest things for me in the work that I do in trauma, usually in post-war situations, but you know, in any place at any time, is to help people become aware. Awareness is so critical because we, you know, we have our worldview. You know. We live in this world and to expand that worldview to see more of who people are and how we fit in relationship with those people, we need awareness to expand our world. This is what we try to teach our students at, at the Center for Justice and Peace Building is to become aware of your surroundings, to see the whole picture, not just little pieces of it. And this is what a good artist does too. A good artist sees the whole and the shadow and the light, the volume, the form. And we need to we need to work on that ourselves. And it's a work. It's a lifelong work. It's a journey. It's not something that just happens that all of a sudden everything is revealed. So I continue to walk that path and stay on this journey. I don't know where we are with time. More questions? Okay. I, I just want to say, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist, and some of you have heard of individuals um, trying to help them change their lives. Often, for around the 
It's good to hear. And the, uh, another thing that we need to do in the work of building trust is to take care of ourselves. Self care, you talk about boundaries in your above work, but it really is about uh, sometimes saying no to, to you know, requests that are made of us. Uh, exercise, diet, all the range of things are critical for this. And celebrating joy and laughter being with friends that we trust and care about. All this is important in the work that we do to you know, on this journey that we are all part of. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you online, I, I hope you uh, glean from this. And the question uh, that I leave you with is where do you the trust? with um, yourself, with others, uh, across groups, and uh, how will you go about doing that? What awarenesses do you need to take you forward? So thank you. And if you wanna look up initiatives of change uh, online, it's easy enough. IFC, uh, and I, I never, I'm very bad at asking for contributions, but you know, if you felt that 